It's Sunday, May 9th, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. Before we get to this week's interview, which is the first part of a recording that we did at the National Science Foundation last month when I interviewed the influential skeptic Ray Hyman, Well, I want to remind our listeners about the amazing meeting this July in Las Vegas. It is the largest event of its kind in the world, and Ray Hyman, along with figures like Paul Kurtz and James Randi, of course, will be participating for the first time ever in a panel discussion on the origins of the modern skeptical movement. And this is also going to include a video by Martin Gardner, other people involved. Uh, In addition, the amazing meeting this year has double the amount of workshops over last year, some amazing evening shows are planned, and a really fantastic list of confirmed speakers as part of the main program. So if you haven't yet registered, I invite you to go to randy.org and do so today. Now about this week's interview. The National Capital Area Skeptics, one of the oldest local skeptical organizations in the United States, presented an award to Ray Hyman last month, the Philip J. Class Award. The conversation that I had with him at the National Science Foundation, well, it went for over an hour, so we're dividing it up over two episodes here. Um, And now a little about Ray Hyman. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Oregon. He's taught at Stanford, Harvard, many other leading institutions. He's made his mark on parapsychology as something of an expert critic of the field. He's published a number of books, including The Elusive Quarry and The Nature of Psychological Inquiry. He's impacted parapsychology by investigating the claims of the Gonsfeld and the Otto Gonsfeld experiments and a number of other important call them cases in the history of parapsychology. In addition to his work investigating parapsychology, he's also been a professional magician and mentalist, and that actually plays into his skepticism, as you'll hear in our conversation. Here, then, is my conversation with Ray Hyman. I will turn it over to the two of them and uh, step back and listen to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis, and congratulations, Ray, on the Philip J. Class Award. I think a good place to begin for the exploration of your impact on skepticism is how does a a young psychology student get into this parapsychology racket? In other words, why you, not your colleagues? Why? What interested you early on, going 50 years ago, to apply science to this burgeoning field? Actually, it goes back way beyond 60 years. I uh, did my first professional magic show at age seven. Uh, What happened was my father, for my birthday, gave me a few magic tricks. Mm -hmm. I took him to school to show and tell, and uh, I did the magic tricks, and the teacher said, thought it was cute, I guess. She said, (laughs) would you want to do this for the Parent Teachers Association? I did, and they gave me... $5. $5. That was a long time ago, and that was a lot of money. And uh, I was able to get a top hat with that $5, and a printer printed a lot of cards for me, and he called me the Merry Mystic, because I lived on the Mystic River, apparently, so I was known as the Merry Mystic. I spread those cards all over the city of Everett, Massachusetts. That's where I was. Not a great city to be, but it's a good city to be <laughs> from, okay? And... Um, I got hired by the library for their story hour, and, and it went off from there. I, 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 it took off, so I got books out of the library when I could read, and um, I learned there was a guy named Houdini, hmm. and he was a favorite. He was a great magician, so, and he was a skeptic. He went around exposing spiritualists. I never heard of them before, but it's something I had to do because I'm a magician, right? Hmm. A young magician, so I know at least from age 16, I never got to attend a seance, 
But I was able to go to, they used to have, all, all through the Boston area, uh, there were spiritual churches, and they would have uh, message readings. Mm -hmm. And you could come, and there would be someone stand at the podium, a visiting spiritualist or someone, and he would, people would write their questions, and they'd be collected in a box, and then put in a, on a on a stage, and uh, he'd reach in and take out one of the folded slips and put it to his head and answer the question, mm -hmm. okay? And um, so I I remember one of the meetings I was at, I was 16, I'm sure, at that time. And I was 16, and about the next in age to me, next closest would be about 60 to 70 years old. These were elderly people, mostly elderly women and, mm -hmm. and some men uh, who were trying to reach the lost one. During this church service where yeah, the exactly. minister used the Q&A Act right. to inspire belief right. in spirit communication. And some of these people were pretty awful in their technique. And um, I remember there was one man who was doing this, and he was old, and he lost his touch. He had a blindfold on, and he would grab the, the thing and put it to his head, but first he opened it a little bit, and he <laughs> couldn't see too, too well, so he would hold, look it up. It was pretty obvious. <laughs> and I looked, I saw it, all these people are going to see this, and they'd be very upset, but everyone was looking everywhere except at him. Mm. No one was looking at this guy. And a lady sitting beside me, a nice little old lady, uh, she was looking at the ceiling. I said, look, look at this guy. She said, she looked at me and then she looked behind her, but she would not look there. And I realized even at that young age that these people don't want to see mm. uh, this thing. Even though they're being obviously uh, being duped, they didn't want to see it. Mm. So I learned lessons like that uh, uh, as a kid. I, I went to a lot of those things. The next thing I did, though, they had um, a spiritualist development class. What that was, was they, you could go to this class and the lady guiding it, uh, she was a spiritualist medium, mm -hmm. she had her own uh, contact with the spirit world uh, and they all had Indian names. Hers was Running Water or something like that, I remember. <laughs> and she assigned us each a spirit guide. And, uh, and each meeting would open up where her spirit guide, Running Water, would come uh, into the room from the back mm -hmm. and come up the aisle and get on the stage and sit beside her. Of course, this is an invisible person. <laughs> see but but uh, this person would come and she would run down and help because it was an old spirit meeting, mm -hmm. obviously. She would help it up on the stage, you know. And pretty soon after a couple of meetings, other people were running to help the spirit up onto the stage. And they're all acting as if it's real. And I began feeling, boy, you know, I'm getting to feel like it's real, too. So I did stop <laughs> right at that point. <laughs> I love that. So uh, you're, you're actually drawing a really direct line from your background and interest in magic to your skepticism. And I love hearing the story about the spiritualist church. It tracks almost exactly James Randi's experience at age 14, where he stumbled in a spiritualist church in Toronto and saw the minister doing a Q&A act. And he was so enraged with a kind of righteous indignation that he marched right up to the pulpit and exposed the guy's magic tricks. Of course, he was arrested. And, you know, so at 14, at 16 in your case, it's that magic and skepticism connection. Do you think that's a necessary connection? In other words, there are all sorts of magicians out there who aren't motivated to go out and use their background in magic to advance critical thinking. There are even some magicians who believe, uh, there are, you know, mm -hmm. there are some famous magicians who supported the reality of Uri Geller. Even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, being a magician isn't a necessary or sufficient condition to be a good skeptic. But in your case, it definitely fueled it. Well, and also in Randy's case, mm -hmm. Randy gets credit, and Randy actually sometimes talks as if it's because he's a magician. Mm -hmm. But Randy is more than that. Randy is a Renaissance type of person. He has other kinds of background. He's a very smart guy, and uh, he has other talents. And it's not because he's a magician necessarily that he's good at what he does. He has other talents as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but but you're explaining your interest in parapsychology through magic. Yes, you're saying it, maybe if you weren't into magic as a young psychology student at Boston University, you wouldn't have, uh, or or at at Harvard eventually, or when you wrote um, your you published your first paper 50 years ago, maybe you wouldn't have gone in that direction had you not the magic background. Oh sure, I'm, that's probably very likely so. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, but I, I, I must admit. That as far back as I can remember, and that remember it's, seven is still pretty young, and it's a long time ago for me. Um, I can't ever remember not being a skeptic. Mm. 
I do remember living in Italy for a while. I lived for 14 years in Italy. Uh, I was on the, uh, teaching at the University of Bologna. And uh, I do remember having some thoughts that, you know, I missed out a lot in life. These people going to the, the pageant and the ceremonies at mm -hmm. the churches and stuff like that, mm -hmm. something I missed out on. Maybe I missed something. Uh, so I did have that little pang of uh, just a little bit uh, that maybe I missed out on something, not having having ever believed anything. Mm -hmm. I, I never can remember any moment in my life where I ever believed in anything so that, that, was, that I couldn't test by evidence. You're admitting that you basically started out as a skeptic. Uh, you, you never went through this period in your life where you earnestly believed, ex examined the evidence, and then changed your mind. No, you started out as a skeptic. I always was, as far as I know. Yeah. You, you published your first paper on parapsychology in 1957 in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. Uh, most of your work as a skeptic, really resulting from that and all the other papers that you published, put you in this kind of no man's land as a skeptic between the, call them the knee-jerk skeptics, the people who dismiss these claims out of hand, and the unduly credulous parapsychologists. You were in neither of those camps. I mean, you were seriously a skeptic, but you, at least at the time, considered the questions worth asking, and in an open-minded, fair-minded way, you looked at the evidence. You, all, you offered a kind of corrective to the skeptics community uh, did you ever get much flack from skeptics for being too, too nice to the believers? Well, actually, I wasn't that nice a skeptic at the, re at the beginning. <laughs> but that was your I, reputation I as had, it developed. I, yeah. Best I can remember, I was like other skeptics when I first began. It was a lot of fun putting down those guys <laughs> and showing that they were a bunch of idiots. Mm. And at some point, I did change. But I know it must have been fairly early because when I wrote that paper in 1957, mm -hmm. I actually was invited to do it by the editor of the, William Wallace, who was the editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association. There was a big controversy going on at that time over the work by Soul and Bateman on, um, on, on this uh, psychic they had been testing mm -hmm. for, for quite a while. At that time, this was considered the strongest evidence for parapsychology. A guy named Basil Shackleton and later a lady named Mary Stewart. They just had two these, these two subjects, but these people were consistent. Experiment after experiment, they could produce their results, which was very unusual. And so this was the greatest evidence there was, and there was a big controversy over it at the time, and so the editor of the, the Journal of the American Statistical Association, he knew me as a statistician, as a magician, and as a psychologist, and he said, those are the three components that, that are just right for someone to be able to unravel what's going on here. Mm -hmm. But you didn't set out to debunk it. You wanted no, to no. look into the research. He asked me to do that, to, to yeah. try and settle the issue once and for all, because it had been, actually, science had devoted two issues to it, you know. And um, so I had always been a skeptic of parapsychology. I believe it was just a lot of bunk and, uh, and, and that they, 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 they didn't do good experiments. And I trusted, because my, my mentors were Martin Gardner. He was you know, my mentor, I'm a good friend, and uh, mm -hmm. but person I trusted. And uh, there was Randy at that time even, and other people. All my information about what parapsychologists were doing was secondhand. Mm -hmm. I never really looked at their literature ever before that. So, but when I got this invitation in 57, I was asked to try to settle this big issue. I went back and read all Ryan's work. Mm -hmm. it took me a little while, and I read um, uh, Sol and Bateman's work and so on. And I was surprised. I was absolutely dumbfounded because they were doing better experiments than they were being, you know, they were being criticized for the wrong thing. They kind of got a bad rap among the yeah. skeptics. They were better and, statisticians. Yeah, yeah. They were better statisticians than they were given credit for. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're more sophisticated than the critics were in the statistics part of it. They were, they could do some good experiments and they did some bad experiments, but it was better than what, what I had been led to believe. But even by my friends, I trusted. It turned out that the friends I trusted and the sources I trusted would, would pick the bad experiments and, and ignore the, they didn't know the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the good experiments in parapsychology actually were pretty sophisticated. There was things wrong with it, but it, you were going to attack it, you had to attack it at a more sophisticated level. Mm -hmm. And not just dismiss it out of hand That's as right. a bunch because of... Because they were trying to be scientific, and unlike Uri Geller and, and the astrologists and so yeah, these people were trying to produce evidence according to scientific standards. They were trying to use the best statistics, the best experimental controls and so on. So 
I felt at that time that they should be handled at that level. And I got into what I now think was a mistake. I got into this mm. belief that only people who had carefully read their best studies and had the statistical know-how and the experimental know-how had the sufficient background to be uh, fair critic. So you, in other words, at that time, you've changed your mind, but at that time, you argued that leave the criticism of this parapsychology research to other researchers, in, right. the, you know, statisticians or right. psychologists, and the, and the armchair skeptics should stay out of it. That, that was your line then. Yeah, and, and the bad consequence of that belief system was that I only, could, I only knew myself and <laughs> perhaps later Jim Alcock mm -hmm. and maybe later Richard Wiseman there are no other people who have the background to criticize mm -hmm. it. No, who know the, the area, what, what they actually, these parapsychologists actually are doing, and who have the statistical and the experimental know-how mm -hmm. to do it. So every time that someone wanted a critic, they would call me, because once, once you become known as, as an expert critic, mm -hmm. everyone, that's how you become an expert. Everyone now com comes to you. Right. And every time a newspaper, a, a TV station, anyone was going to do something, they'd always call me. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, I don't want to get involved with it. They say, well, who, who should we, who can we, and I would think, I, well, I can't think of anyone else who has, so I better do it. Because of your position at the time That's that right. only a few qualified people exactly. could do it. Yeah. And unfortunately, even though I find it boring, I, I don't like reading <laughs> or paying attention to it because parapsychology research is the most boring thing there is in the world, believe me. Mm. It's just a bunch of guesses. Uh, lots of data, and you do statistical testing. Mm -hmm. And, well, it, and then, if it has any connection to the paranormal, I don't know what the connection would be. So it's just dull. Well, it, it, you're, you're bringing up a couple things just then. One, this expert position that you and a couple others were in, and you said other skeptics were not qualified to engage in criticism. You've changed your mind on that. The other thing you just brought up is the notion of parapsychology being boring. Well, a lot of science is actually boring. A lot of, you know, all due respect, we're at the National Science Foundation, but, you know, a lot of research is on very small questions. But when you put it all together, it helps flesh out our understanding of like the picture of reality. So I'm not sure if a criticism of parapsychology is that it's boring, the implications of it are in fact very exciting. If we could prove that minds exist outside the body or that minds can uh, in some extrasensory sort of way communicate or survive death, that's anything but boring. It's, it's, uh, it's the big questions. Well, there's a lot of stuff you just brought up uh, <laughs> which is important to make out. First of all, science is not boring because it's dealing with very specific questions. Mm -hmm. And these questions arise in, a, in a, what Kuhn called normal science. In, a, in doing science, you have a framework, mm -hmm. and you're testing a theory, and you have hypotheses that come out of that framework. And each experiment sometimes can challenge, bring results that challenge the framework. It makes it interesting, mm -hmm. but you know exactly what's going on. But and, you're and saying we, in parapsychology that doesn't They don't exist. have a framework. Yeah. They don't have any. They don't have a subject matter. They just have data. And if it has any collection to the paranormal, over 150 years, I've never seen them make any, show any connection. Mm -hmm. It's hits or misses. It's yeah. not, you don't draw a direct line yeah. to paranormal or parapsychological belief from all the hits and misses. I don't know. I don't know how anyone's ever demonstrated any connection or how getting results that are sometimes people guessing better than chance under some conditions, how that relates to anything paranormal or anything else. Uh, it could be thousands of reasons why you get differences from chance. Most of it is because data mining and stuff like that, mm. you know. Uh, but, um, there's been never any tie of a theory. They have what we call it, they, even parapsychologists, many of them recognize it. They don't have a positive theory of psi. Mm -hmm. When they do their research, uh, they have people guess or they do other things. They, what they have is you have a, a sets of alternatives and then you have what should be expected by chance. And um, they don't have any rationale. They don't have a positive theory about what should, what they should should be there, what the pattern of the results should be. Uh, so what happens is what's called the patchwork quilt fallacy mm. that they they fall into, which other scientists don't do, because scientists do have a very specific hypothesis and there's got to be a specific pattern they're predicting. Parapsychologists, if you get something that's different from chance and you can't explain it by, right away, you can't explain it by some mundane, as they call it, mundane theory about the world that in terms of ordinary science, then they say, aha, parapsychology. So it's a negative definition of mm -hmm. it. 
as a result, because it's negative, unlike other scientific testing and stuff like that, uh, there's no way for them to be wrong. Uh, if anything happens that's above chance, even though it's not what they predicted, it's mm -hmm. still psi because they have no way of telling you what's not psi. Yeah, you're raising a couple things there. What in philosophy of science is called the demarcation problem, what science and what isn't. You're saying parapsychology is not science because it doesn't play by the other rules of science. Uh, you're, and you're also saying it kind of that a lot of the evidence that people use in parapsychology to argue for its claims is kind of an argument from ignorance. It's saying, um, I don't, I don't know how to explain this. Therefore, I know the explanation is paranormal, supernatural, something like that. Um, and so you say it's out of the bounds of science, but for 50 years, you've in a fair-minded way looked into it. Uh, you know, you, you've garnered this reputation being open-minded. Uh, you haven't found any evidence to support it. It sounds like you're suggesting Maybe that wasn't the right approach. Well, you've got a lot of things you, you attributed to me in that, all that. <laughs> I don't disagree with it, but I didn't say it so far. I haven't right. said those things yet. Mm -hmm. You've said them. Um, and we, we only have an hour and five minutes to see right. if I'm right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I did change my mind about a lot of things. Because up to 1950 was uh, the big uh, challenge where I took the Gansfeld experiments, mm -hmm. again, I was challenged, I was asked to evaluate for two different things, for the IEEE, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, they, for some reason, broke their their rules and they actually published a long article by Robert John, pro-parapsychology, and that created a furor, so they decided to balance it with me. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to do a tutorial on parapsychology for the IEEE journal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, something they don't usually deal with in that kind of a journal. And then I was also asked at another time, it was the 100th anniversary of the founding of uh, Society for Psychical Research. In 1982 was the 100th anniversary, and uh, they held it at Cambridge, England, and they invited me to come as a skeptic to talk. So in both cases, I said, okay, this is a good time for me to evaluate the status of parapsychology. You know, my first foray into doing this was back in 19... 57. Mm -hmm. Now so it's 1980. Yeah. yeah, now it's 1982. Um, once and for all, maybe I should, but I can't, have, there's so much, so many papers by then in parapsychology, it, it was impossible for me to sit down and read them all. And then also, I, I didn't want to take a, a sample of papers because in any field, the majority of papers are, are, are mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. uh, we evaluate the field in terms of the very top, their best output. So I wanted to be fair, and I want, so I went around and asked every major parapsychologist I could. I said, could you tell me what is the best evidence you have now, the best program in parapsychology, the very best? And unanimously, almost unanimously, they said this Gansfeld experiments. Mm -hmm. So I then asked Ch Charles Arnerton, who published the first Gansfeld experiment, if he could help me, uh, I was, was interested in evaluating them. And he was all excited to have an outsider, you know, uh, to look into their, what they, he considered their best research. And he said he would help me get every paper, even the unpublished ones. Mm. And ultimately, after three months, he sent me, my, I was teaching at Stanford at the time. I had their spook chair that, for that year. <laughs> and um, I received six, a stack of 600 pages. Wow. Half of them um, uh, consisting of what he counted as 42 separate Gunsville experiments. That's an issue we won't get into now, but how, how you count what's an experiment, what's not, it was a big, can be a big issue. But there were fewer reports than that, but they covered, he called, he counted as 42 separate experiments, and most of them were significant, okay? And uh, this is what I had to evaluate. It took me, um, ultimately, three months my first go around, actually, ultimately, it, went, it took up three, of my, three years of my life, most of my professional life, to go to, into this big battle, which culminated in a 1985 issue of the Journal of the Parapsychological Association, and they devoted the whole issue to this, contra this debate between Monaghan and myself. I had something like 50 pages a plus of my critique mm -hmm. of that Gansfield literature, and Arnerton had been given a year to go over that and get, make his reply, and he had a long reply there. I thought his reply was 
in many ways stupid. He and he didn't like my thing in the first place, obviously. So I uh, asked, and the Parapsychological Association agreed if I could respond to his response. So I wrote another something like 85 page <laughs> response to it all. That never got published for an interesting reason. Uh, I happened to meet with Arnerton. He was now going over my thing to write his rebuttal to my <laughs> new rebuttal, okay? And uh, he was almost in tears. He said, you said so many bad things about me in this thing here. And I said, I didn't say anything bad about you. I just cited uh, all of the ways you were wrong, especially in response <laughs> to me. You just made up things which aren't there. And so we had this first a little animosity, but then we began talking. I realized as we talked more and more, two things struck me. One is that he was agreeing to a lot of my major points. Mm. For example, I was surprised he was agreeing, yes, by itself, those experiments don't prove anything until we can replicate them. Already, that was a big concession. That's a big breakthrough yeah. for a parapsychologist to admit. Right. Yeah. And he made, made some other admissions. And the other thing I realized is that we were fighting over, what we were fighting over were nitty-gritty of individual experiments. Did they do it right? Did they use the right statistical tests in this case and so on? These were details that no one but he and I were, were privy to because we, we both had spent, gone through this. There were, at that time, when our, that first, that issue came out of the Journal of Parapsychology, all the parapsychological world was saying, oh boy, Arnerton has demolished Hyman. Mm. He really showed him up. The skeptics were saying, Hyman has demolished Arnerton, <laughs> okay? None of these people on either side had gone through, the, actually gone through, actually read the same articles, gone ne through. Neither camp could actually know because they That's were, right. they were steeped I, I, I in the research. And dawned on me that none of the, they, the, the parapsychologists were taking Arnerton's word that for what he was saying about these experiments, the skeptics were taking my word. So I knew that uh, no one's ever going to accept, you know, no one's ever going to go through all the work of, of seeing what we were f fighting over, who was right or wrong on, on that issue. But the other thing I realized is that Hey, he's willing to admit that those experiments by themselves don't demonstrate the existence of Psi. Mm. They have to be independently replicated. Even though they were supposedly the best research exactly, in the field. Exactly. Yeah. So I said, look, I'll withdraw my, my, my latest thing, uh, and maybe we can do a, a joint article on what we agree. And so we went back and forth, and we did punt, uh, publish this joint communique, which said what we thought should be the case, what would be necessary in order to... Uh, replicate these experiments. Of course, the follow-up from that was that, uh, in fact, this was published in the 1950, unusual for the psychological journal to do, uh, in 1950, about the time the Psych Bulletin published a big article by Daryl Bem, a major parapsychologist, uh, ma 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 major social psychologist who became a friend of Arnerton. You Arnerton. said 1950? No. Uh, 19, um, no, it was 1990, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, Okay, you know, um, I well, there's a, a lot we're world. talking about, yeah. No, I live in a different world anyways. Yeah. Um, but, uh. Your joint communique. A joint communique, yeah. uh, we, we, we agreed on what should be done. Subsequently, Arnerton then finished a series of experiments, which he called the Otto Gonsfeld experiment, mm -hmm. which he said met all the criteria we set out, and they were, had, had replicated the original Gonsfeld database. It didn't replicate at all. And this, this is, I now realize that we're living different worlds. They mm. call, they, their notion of replicability is weird, mm. to say the <laughs> least. And by the way, the next issue, I think will be the next issue, or soon, one of the next issues of the Psychological Bulletin, it's going through this story all over again. They're publishing a long article by some contemporary parapsychologists showing that the Gansfeld data, the latest Gansfeld data, replicate the original Gansfeld and the original ones, okay? Mm. And they do what was called meta-analysis, which is uh, another word for um, uh, voodoo, okay? <laughs> and, um, and so, so this, this being published in the, in the psychological bulletin, but they asked me to comment on it, and um, it is the worst stuff I've ever seen. I mean, wow. at this point, I, I, you know, after 50-something years, I've lost my patience. Mm -hmm. This is... BS, okay? Well, well, in fact, that gets to the question where possibly I was putting words in your mouth, who knows, yeah. but where the implication of what you're saying sounds to me like it's all a fool's errand. Having a few experts really look at the parapsychology research, uh, you never really engage with the parapsychologists. They have their camp that believe the, their leaders, the skeptics, without knowing the research, have their kind of skeptic heroes that they just 
believe in, you know, without being steeped in, in the research. And so are you suggesting that, it, it, that that's not the best approach uh, when responding to these sorts of claims? Well, it's not as simple as that. And um, what happened to me was I've decided I had this epiphany, and epiphany is not the word that you should use in my <laughs> context, but <laughs> I'll call it an epiphany anyways. It, took, it wasn't all of a sudden, though. It was mm-hmm. gradual. It dawned on me, beginning with that joint communique, it dawned on me that I had made a terrible mistake in one sense. I had focused on the flaws and the statistical shortcomings of what parapsychologists were doing. And I was showing that, that was my goal at that time, was showing that because of all those flaws, they can't use this as evidence for anything until they clean up their act. Uh, I realized that's wrong. At, at some point, I realized that was a, a, a wrong approach. Mm. The main reason, I won't give you all the reasons, but the main reason it's the wrong approach is because focusing on the flaws in their experiments switched the burden of proof from them. Remember, it's, they're, they're the one that should be trying to prove something, not me. Mm-hmm. But they, they, they immediately, the whole 1985 issue of the Journal of Parapsychology devoted to that debate between Arnton and myself. It's focusing on flaws. It did this experiment to have these flaws? Did, did these statistical uh, flaws? And if, since they did have, if they did have these flaws, did these flaws make a difference? And I think that was a wrong mistake because everything, everyone, was, everyone was focusing on that. And that's not the issue. Whether they have flaws or not, the issue is, can they independently replicate those? And they cannot. And that's something you don't need to be a fancy statistician or, or study their literature in detail uh, or be a good experimentalist. All you have to realize is that it's a necessary thing, regardless of what you think science is or is not. And there are a lot of people who make their living by writing books, philosophers of science, they, they're called themselves, and historians <laughs> of science. They write books on what is science, what isn't science, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But regardless of that, a necessary condition for something to be science, not a sufficient, but a necessary condition is that you've got to have something, you've got to have a, a subject matter. And science, since uh, the early days of uh, uh, Galileo, Newton, and so on, has survived and done so well because it only deals with data that can be independently replicated. That's mm-hmm. how you know there's something mm-hmm. there. But parapsychology doesn't have a there, doesn't have something there. Mm. They can't replicate. And even some of the major parapsychologists today are uh, claiming that, in fact, uh, parapsychology cannot produce the kind of evidence that science requires. So they want to lower the bar. They still believe in parapsychology. You're jumping the gun, yeah. but yeah. 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 You're taking the words out of my mouth, but that's why you're here. That's why psychic powers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, don't, don't tell okay. the skeptical audience. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. I'm glad you did that. Um, but uh, the, these, these parapsychologists say that, look, we cannot produce an independently replicable experiment. But they don't say, that means we don't have anything. Instead, they go, they have two, two things they say. That's the nature of psi. Psi, <laughs> is, it's an actual property of it. It's the kind of phenomenon that as you're getting close in on it, it plays tricks on you and it, it goes off some other direction. This is taking us back to the ancient Greek gods, you know, and the, um, uh, where things happen because of the whim of these mm-hmm. Zeus and stuff like that. So that's where they're going, uh, as far as I can tell. They also throw in some quantum mechanics, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, but anything that's a mystery, uh, they throw, throw in. You know, they take that, 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 that all grist to their mill. And uh, they also, these, these parapsychologists who admit that they cannot produce scientific evidence, they say two things. One is that, well, that shows that there really is something there because it, it deliberately avoids being scientific. Mm-hmm. But also, they uh, say that there's something wrong with science, not with uh, parapsychology. Science, we have to change. In fact, Bob John and Brenda Dunn, his uh, co-worker, uh, have written an article called Change the Rules. <laughs> In other words, they want science to change. And it reminds me of um, when uh, I was on uh, Scientific American Frontiers with Alan Alda. Mm-hmm. They came to Eugene and because they wanted me to set up a test of a dowser and also had me do some palm reading on that program. But... When we tested the dowser, who was a very nice guy, and he, he knew he was coming into the lion's den, and that he cooperated, and he failed completely on everything we did. And El Maldo, who was a very nice guy, took me aside and said, Ray, says, I'm very concerned. This guy is just, he's a nice guy, and he's bungling everything. 
you know, we have to say that, but we have to say, how can we say it without hurting him too much? You know? <laughs> and I remember we got in the van after we, we tested at the fairgrounds in Eugene because he, he had to find a place that was independent of in, interference. So we went all over Eugene and we went to the fairgrounds and that was where Thousand Rod said, this is a safe place to be tested. So that's where we tested him. And uh, so we're going back in a van back to the University of Oregon where we were doing most of the interviewing. And, and Alan began asking this Thousand, he said, you know, look, you were so sure about what you could do. You were absolutely sure you could produce this and do exactly, find these targets just as you said you could, and you, you missed everything up. How do you account for that? So the Stouser said, well, I don't blame Professor Hyman. He, he treated me well. He did everything. Everything was fair that way. Everything was done fairly. Everyone was nice. You were nice and so on. All I can say is that the problem is that science hasn't caught up with us yet. Mm. Mm. And since then, this is what I think the parapsychologists are now saying, who admit that, by the way, it's only half the parapsychologists. The other half of parapsychologists are just in the opposite, saying that we have now established the reality of psi, Scientifically. Uh, scientifically, yeah. beyond any doubt, reasonable doubt. So you have these two camps now in parapsychology. And they're fighting with each other. You're, uh, they don't fight with each other. They don't even well, they disagree. Oh, no, they okay. don't even talk. I, I wish I could get them. I, I spoke at, um, there was a meeting in uh, two years, three years ago in the uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, they had uh, two Nobel Prize winners mm -hmm. and some other people. They had this forum on parapsychology, but they had me there as well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the idea was to examine the current state of parapsychology and why, this was in the program, and why scientists are not accepting the evidence even when it's there. Mm -hmm. this, so, they beg the question already. So that's one camp, but this other camp that says there's not going to be evidence the way science, scientists want there to be because those, those criteria are too stringent to, it's, science is too demanding. The comments you made just a minute ago when you're, I think, talking about changing approaches where originally expert critics like yourself would criticize the research methods, right, and say, here's a failing or there's a failing. You're now saying maybe that was a fool's errand in that right now anyone, an armchair skeptic, could say, just repeat it, just that it's repeatable and then uh, uh, they don't have to be statisticians or experts. That does seem to be a shift of uh, approaches. Okay, uh, okay, it, it, to simplify it, okay, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll accept it at that level. But the point I wanted to make, I was trying to make, was that at this meeting, uh, mm. with the two Nobel Prize winners, by the way, uh, as well, there's quite, quite some prestigious people there. Richard Wiseman was there and mm -hmm. I was there. My goal was there was to, I wanted to, bring these two camps of parapsychology confront one another and say, okay, well, how do you handle this? Because mm -hmm. Jessica Utz was there and Dean Radin was there. They're, they're on the side of the people who say, we have established the reality of psi beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. And we've done it by the hardest of hard scientific procedures. Mm -hmm. And then there's this other camp of people, and I quoted them, I had them, I had a list of them. They weren't, only Bob John was there, so they had one of them there. Uh, who said that, no, we don't have, we can't repeat anything. We don't have, according to scientific evidence, we don't have anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to bring them together and say, well, how do you account for this? And this was the whole point of my talk. Mm -hmm. I got no response whatsoever. There's no, 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 no response from the parapsychologists, and I still have not find. So they don't acknowledge one another, they don't, but they don't even talk about this. Mm -hmm. And I can't get them to come. I can't, how come these other guys are saying that there's nothing there? They don't. They won't respond. Mm. And uh, I don't know what's going on. It is, it's weird. These people, I don't think, they live in a different world. At first, they, 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 my experience, with, when I meet parapsychologists, I'm very impressed with them. They're very nice people. They're trained and have a PhD in something or other. Mm -hmm. They know their science. Uh, they're well-read. Uh, you consider them sincere. They're yeah. not trying to pull one over and, on and people. That's, and that's until you, I'll give you one story, and I'll, I'll mention his name because I don't mind being sued now. Um, <laughs> Charlie Tart was a major parapsychologist for a while. I don't know if you ever heard of him. It was Targ, it's also Tart, T-A-R-T. Well, uh, when I was at Stanford, Percy Diaconis was somehow a friend of Charlie Tart's, but you know, he was a friend of mine, and uh, he's a teacher, magician. statistician, he's also a famous magician. He said, Ray, it'd be good to get together with Charlie Tart. He's at, teach, he's up there and he lives right next to, to Berkeley and, um, but he taught at UC Davis. And so we went and visited him. We spent, had a nice day. He was a nice, uh, host. He ran me through some of his psi experiments mm -hmm. there and, uh, we discussed things and, uh, he told me how 
we had more in common than were the extremists on both sides. You know, he said, you know, we ought to stay together and be good friends and stuff like that. Uh, when I left and went back to Eugene, I left Stanford and went back to Eugene, suddenly uh, I get this um, note from uh, Charles Tart saying, you, you were on this program, he says, you think I don't know about it, you were on this program in Canada, a TV show, and you criticize my work. Mm. And since we're friends, you have no right to do that unless you ch first check with me first. Wow. That's and not how first, science works, huh? Yeah, I, but, but anyways, I didn't remember talking about his work even on his program. So I called the uh, producer of the show, and she was very nice. She was very, she went through, she said, I went through, not only did I go over the show, but I went through the outtakes. We never mentioned Charles Tartarer's wow. work. Wow. And she wrote him a letter saying that. I didn't hear anything. You'd think he wanted to thank, you know, to apologize, something like that. A month after that, he got another letter saying, you did it again. Well, he says, you think I'm not aware of this, but I have friends that live in Italy, and you are on an Italian television, and you uh, criticize my work again. Well, that, the whole show in Italy was on Regella, and I don't remember mention Tarku's work. And I mm -hmm. again contacted uh, the people in Italy. They were very nice. They went over it, and they said, there's no, no mention of anyone by the name of Charles Tart in the program. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to, uh, and I also had the, the, the producer in Italy, wrote to Charles Tart and said, we didn't mention your work at all. Next time I saw Charles Tart, I was attending a parapsychological association meeting. They meet, they invite me every once in a while to show that they don't have any horns. And um, <laughs> so I was attending the meeting, and Tart was there. And every time I walked, walked up to him, I was going to say hello or something like that. He would turn his back and leave me. Wow. They had a big party they were holding. And uh, I was in the room at this party, parapsychological party. He walked in the room. He saw me. He turned around, made a big it wasn't, and just subtly, he made a big show of it. He turned his back and marched out. Mm. And I said, okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. But I don't know what's going on. But I found also, that's just one example. When I meet parapsychologists, I'm impressed with them. They're, they're nice people. They're, they are uh, well-read. They seem to be fair-minded and so on. The more I get to know them, and deep and deeper, suddenly peculiar things begin coming out. <laughs> Uh, and that's just one example. But well, I've met skeptics for whom that also applies. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all peculiar in some way. I, by the way, I always point out that, in my mind, skeptics are mutants. We are not, mm. the brain, we are not, as a psychologist, everything I know about human evolution and psychology, uh, it's not normal to be a skeptic. We're an aberration, right? Yeah, a, a mutant, I would call yeah, us. A mutant. Uh, so we, we, are, we are actually not normal people. <laughs> Because uh, it's not typical to be a skeptic. Mm. It's very, very difficult. It's a very unusual thing to be a skeptic about anything. So that was the first part of my conversation with Ray Hyman, who is the recipient this year of the Philip J. Class Award conferred by the National Capital Area Skeptics. And now, in this week's installment of The Honest Liar, we hear about how Ray Hyman once joined a channeler on the radio. Here's Ray's cohort in that adventure, Jamie Ian Swiss. Turn your radio off. Uh, but not yet. It was January 7th, 1990, and Ray Hyman was visiting the Washington, D.C. area to address the National Capital Area Skeptics, or NCAS, on the subject of Why Are We Fooled? Ray is a psychology professor, now emeritus, from the University of Oregon, an author, an expert critic of parapsychology, a former professional magician, and a founding member of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, formerly known as PSYCOP, and now rather less known simply as CSI. Ray was being trailed by a TV crew that weekend from CBS's 48 Hours for the duration of his visit to D.C. because they were doing a feature about parapsychology and had chosen to focus on Ray to represent the skeptic's viewpoint. So along with my friends Chip and Grace Denman, my co-founders of National Capital Area Skeptics in 1987, we had a fun and breathless weekend traveling around the Washington, D.C. area and the southern Maryland suburbs where the Denmans and I lived at the time. That Sunday, we began the morning with a taping of a radio talk show. Then in the afternoon, Ray gave his public presentation for NCAS. And then on the same evening, Ray, Chip, and myself were slated to appear together on Q107 FM. 
We reported to the studio that evening where we were also met by the 48 Hours crew who were shooting all of Ray's radio appearances that weekend, including another one the following morning. As we waited and chatted with the radio show's producer, we learned that we were to be following an on-air visit from a channeler. You remember channeling, right? This is where a spirit medium of a sort allegedly speaks with the voice of a spirit. Or perhaps it's better to say a spirit speaks through the voice of the medium. Although a practice that has come and gone through literally millennia, you may recall that it experienced a faddish urge of popularity in the New Age 1970s thanks to Shirley MacLaine's effusive endorsement of Jay-Z Knight, who claimed to channel the spirit of Ramtha, the spirit of a 35,000-year-old warrior. Pardon me just a moment. (laughs) Okay. Channeling's a nutty idea, but not all that much nuttier than the likes of John Edward and countless predatory hucksters like him who claim to hear spirit voices in their heads while sparing us the cheap theatrics of bad accents and phony ancient language that comes with channeling. If you consult James Randi's Encyclopedia of Claims, Frauds, and Hoaxes of the Occult and Supernatural and look up channeling, the entry concludes with my personal definition. Channeling is just like bad ventriloquism. They talk funny, but their lips move. This reference is one of the proudest literary achievements of my career. Okay, so back at the radio station, there's a channeler on the air now, along with the host. The channeler, a woman, claims to be channeling the spirit of a 6th century Irishman. She's talking into a microphone with a spirit voice, so she claims, of a 6th century Irishman. Now, how do I know it's really the voice of a 6th century Irish spirit? Does it speak Gaelic? Hell no. What's going on in the studio now is something like a bad Monty Python sketch. Because the spirit doesn't just speak in plain old everyday English. You can tell that this woman is totally possessed with the actual spirit of a 6th century Irishman because she uses thee and thou as personal pronouns. That's right. It's now turned into an on-air renaissance festival, eh, just without the jousting. Well, some jousting was yet to come, I guess. So it was kind of like a renfest, but with even less historical accuracy. (laughs) Ah, uh, I hear you skeptics laughing. How could anything be less historically accurate than your local Renaissance fair? Well, because the Ren fairs are loosely based, emphasis on the word loosely, on Elizabethan England. And you know what? That's just around the time that the pronouns thee and thou first came into use in Old English. About 800 years later than our 6th century Irishman spirit supposedly was old enough to drink his first pint of mead. Now, the host actually has a brain in his head. He thinks the channeler is ridiculous. However, the radio producer is busy explaining to me, with all the self-importance that anyone in media with a small job and a big ego can muster, how she worked so hard to insist to the host that he had to be absolutely completely fair to the channeler by concealing his point of view and not in any way revealing his rational judgment to the public he was pretending to serve and speak truth to. But in the bizarre world of contemporary media, a man of the world speaking actual truth as he sees it just can't possibly be doing the right thing, now can he? We stand and listen to this babbling producer with tight smiles all around because we want to get to the microphones ourselves. She goes back to her important job, but now we start working on the 48 Hours producer. At first, he can't really believe that anyone takes the talking channeler seriously. I mean, it's just too ridiculous, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is, except no, it isn't, because now people are phoning into the show in order to talk to the spirit. Oh, yeah. And they're not just talking to the spirit. They're asking for life advice. The 48 Hours producer thinks that the channeler is so embarrassingly ludicrous that he doesn't even want to turn on his cameras to shoot. How can anyone take this seriously, he asks me, as if the answer was obvious. By this time, I am all but jumping up and down. It doesn't matter if you take it seriously. You're doing a story on parapsychology. Obviously, somebody's taking this lunatic seriously. Watch. Look, they're going to be taking phone calls. Don't you have a responsibility to show it? You don't even need to comment on it. You can just show it. Let it speak for itself. Just show it. But no, it's just too ridiculous for him. So now we're in the studio. Then they add Ray to the uh, panel. That's the host, Ray Hyman, the channeler, and the spirit. 
the last two are sharing a microphone. And so Ray Hyman, as the paragon of intellectual restraint for which he is renowned, the soft-spoken, genteel academic with the steely inner intellectual underbelly of the Terminator, poses his gentle but determinedly rational questions. How would we know if this was a sixth-century Irishman? It might be a sixth-century Irishman, but isn't there some burden of proof that rests with the channeler? Shouldn't we be presented with some supporting evidence before we are convinced? What might the spirit be able to tell us about sixth-century Ireland, for example? Needless to say, no substantive answers are forthcoming. By now, I am sitting in the studio about to go on. The calls are stacking up, and the next caller is picked up by the host. He is a professional pilot, an airline pilot. He asks to speak with the channeler, or uh, with the spirit. And he explains that he is up for another job opportunity, and he's not quite sure what to do. Doth thou ancient Irish spirit have any frickin' advice for me? What? What? WTFFFFFFF before we ever even had text messaging? And did I mention that 48 Hours is never going to show any of this? Now, following this bit of tragic comedy, the host offers me a spot at the dais. At long last, I have a microphone before me. And what do you think, he asks me. What do I think? First of all, let me ask you this. Let's say, for the moment, it is a 6th century Irishman. Let's just stipulate that for a moment. The caller is a pilot, for crying out loud. A pilot. What the hell does a 6th century Irishman know about airplanes? He's never even seen one. He's certainly never been in one. What does he know about career advice for you? What? At which point, I kind of decide to go for broke and offer the listeners some sincere, heartfelt advice about their lives, since that's what they seem to be calling in for. You want some advice? Here's some advice for you. It's Sunday night. It's 9 o'clock. Go out. Get out of the house. Get something to eat. Go to a movie. Hell, rent some porn. Because anything will be better than what you are doing right now listening to the show, which is wasting your life. You want some advice? Turn your radio off now. Turn your radios off. I believe it remains one of my finest moments on live radio. The producer eh, maybe would disagree. Afterwards, Ray actually complimented me on my restraint and signed a copy of his book to me with an inscription to that effect. I guess the fact that I didn't rip the old Irishman's microphone out of the console and choke him with the cable did show some kind of restraint. But Ray has always been a model of restrained rationality for me. And eventually, 48 hours aired, and there was no footage of the channeler, and Ray got a few moments to put in a word for rationalism. But we had all received a first-hand lesson in how the media so often treats these subjects and what its notion of fair play and balanced reportage often amounts to when it comes to presenting stories about pseudoscientific claims. Sometimes, more often than not, perhaps, the best advice might just to be to turn your radio off. This is Jamie Ian Swiss, and I am The Honest Liar. Thank you for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. For updates throughout the week, find me on Twitter and on Facebook. If you want to get involved with an online conversation about today's episode, join the discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on the show aren't necessarily the views of the James Randi Educational Foundation. You can send your questions or comments into info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. Our music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Contributors to today's show included Jamie Ian Swiss and Christina Stevens. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. Grothy.